Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How lovely to see so many of you here. Um, and we are looking forward very much to hearing from Nick. But first of all, I have, as usual, some parish notices. Um, first of all, those of you who completed the survey this evening, thank you very much. If you were given one and would like to complete it, please do so. Um, it's part of the project work for our apprentice, who's Daisy over there. Um, but also, we very much want to know your thoughts on what we do and how we, how we perform for you as friends. So please do. Um, I hope some of you have been to see the open exhibition in the museum. It's excellent. Um, I think it's probably the best one we've ever had. So please do go and, watch and uh, have a look. It's on till the 11th of May. And after that, we have um, an exhibition of photographs of the lives of the people who live and work in the forest by Steve Poole, who's a well-known local photographer, um, which should be very interesting indeed. Um, and our next talk um, relates to our 25th anniversary year, which starts in April. So please do come along and hear what happened in the past, how St. Barb was set up and developed, and Maria will also talk a little bit about what's going to happen in the future. So please come along to that. That's the 3rd of May. And um, the next big event is the Open Gardens, um, which is on the 26th of May, Sunday the 26th of May. And tickets will go on sale uh, at the early part of May. Um, so with that, I'm going to introduce Nick Bubb, um, who is a Limington man, um, been around the world yachting, uh, then he got to New Zealand, I gather. Yeah, I'm told he gets ribbed about that at home. Um, he's an adventurer, done many offshore races and so on. Just come back from doing a double-handed cross-Atlantic race. And a conservationist. He's now taken up the job of Chief Executive Officer of Tusk. So, Nick, we welcome you. Thank you very much, Prue. So th thank you, what a wonderful turnout. Um, and, and, and John especially, thank you for inviting me. I'm gonna run through what I suppose are kind of a few kind of career highlights for me really and a few uh, adventures along the way. Talk briefly about how I've ended up as CEO of Tusk, this wonderful organization supporting wildlife conservation eff efforts across Africa and what we do at Tusk. And also a few references to my time here in Lymington. Um, I've only actually lived here for 15 years, so I still feel like a bit of a newbie, but some of my sailing connections date back, I think, almost 25 years now. Um, and I'm very proud to have contributed to life in the town in a few different roles that I also touch on. And, and, and lastly, earlier this year, thank you, uh, John, to be um, invited me to be an ambassador for, for Limington afloat this autumn, which we'll also um, talk about. So I'm actually an engineer. Um, and when I finished my, my uh, engineering degree in Exeter, I ended up very, uh, very um, not distracted, let's say, by my sailing, and ended up building boats, um, building my own race boats. Um, and, um, and that really was focused on building these boats called Mini Transats, which are six and a half meter or 21 foot um, high-tech carbon boats with swing keels, big French series that you race um, solo across the Atlantic is the, is the big race. Um, this is the start in, in France, I think in 2005, in a Simon Rogers designed boat, who many of you will, will know, um, certainly some of the Rogers family from Lymington. Um, and quickly that um, that opened up new avenues, new doors for me, and I ended up doing a race called the Oryx Quest, which was a, a non-stop round the world race, um, 74 days at sea. And you know, as I you know, I do occasionally give a little bit of advice to younger sailors, and you know, I've I was never the greatest sailor, but I always um, I suppose took to my task with enthusiasm, but also I came with a few skills, and being an engineer and a boat builder really helped, kind of. Um, open up new doors, and so it's always that advice that I give to people now. You know, you've got to have many string, strings to your bow. 
Jesus, yeah. Um, one of the next things I did was race around Britain on this 30-foot trime run. Um, and in fact, uh, I'll embarrass Alex in the corner here who joined me for, for part of that. Um, but again, it was a sort of an early um, insight for me into the best laid plans can quickly, um, can quickly go awry and dismasting off, off Barra in a very remote part of, um, well, just off the Scottish coast. Um, it was hugely disappointing. But again, it was a chance for me to to kind of bring my engineering skills to the fore, and we repaired the mast, and seven days later, we re-stepped it off the little ferry terminal there and finished our, our round Britain and Ireland race. Um, and then I quickly rolled into to doing something called the Route de Ram, which is a big solo um, transatlantic race on a 40-footer, a class 40, um, which we built in France, again, doing it kind of the hard way, but that was the only way. You know, fundraising um, has always been pretty tough. Um, but that was certainly the start for me of, you know, you raise as much money as you can and then you just find a way. Um, then I stepped on from that and I had the chance to do the Volvo Ocean Race, uh, one of the big um, round the world races, um, where I met my now wife, Sophie, who was also working on the team. And some more Lymington connections here. The boat that we were racing on was a Rob Humphreys design, another famous Lymington yacht designer. I actually, the Volvo had never really been my, my big goal or ambition. I wanted to do the Vendee Globe, but uh, this was 2008-9, the global financial crisis, and, and raising money to do the Vendee, the next one was in 2012, was, you know, was always going to be very difficult and, to my mind, became almost impossible. So I reverted back to my engineering again and joined a great friend, Paul Larson, on Vestas Sail Rocket. This is actually Vestas um, 1, and uh, Sophie and I spent three months living out in Namibia, working as an engineer with the team, which, which basically meant fixing it after it got broken pretty much daily. Um, and we went on, I think, to, to set the mile record, and then Vesta Sail Rocket 2 came along, and, and that holds, in fact, still to this day, holds the outright record of uh, 65 knot average over uh, 500 meters. So uh, just unbelievable. And for that to, to be achieved 10 years ago and to still stand is, is incredible. But I didn't join the team for Vestas 2 because I decided that it was time for me to, to learn about business. And I had various ideas. And I see David sat over here. Um, I ended up joining Bruin Dolphin in Livington, which was a you know, big change, but a great chance for me to learn about business and finance. Um, and, I, and I stuck to the task diligently. Some of you in here would have known me as an investment manager. But eventually, uh, adventures came calling, and I had the chance to go and, and skipper a 23-foot wooden rowing boat, which was a replica of the James, James Caird down in Antarctica. And we were retracing Sir Ernest Shackleton's voyage um, nearly 100 years later. And the idea behind this was the Shackleton family and the Discovery Channel wanted to highlight climate change in the intervening 100 years and also celebrate this incredible feat of, of human endurance where you know, his ship, the Endurance, as many of you all know, was, was trapped in the ice and they abandoned to the lifeboats, all 28 of them, I believe, and three lifeboats, made their way to Elephant Island where they set up camp, but it was the start of World War I and there was no way they were going to be rescued. Um, so Shackleton realized this and took three of his best men and three of his most troublesome men um, and, and they left and sailed this incredible open boat voyage 800 miles to South Georgia. So I was the skipper of a team that, that retraced that, but part of it, as I said, was, was this sort of look into um, how the climate had changed and really it was very much citizen science, so looking at kind of glacial retreat would be the most obvious thing. In, the, in that interve intervening period. But we ended up partnering with an organization called Fauna and Flora International, FFI, um, the world's oldest international conservation organization. I became completely you know, absorbed with their work and their history. And, and um, a long story short, uh, briefly came back to Bruin and then took up an opportunity um, to, to join them at FFI as the, the business development director. Oh, yeah, here's, here's some of the images from. Um, from that Shackleton epic. Um, vintage clothing, replica boat. So, um, yeah, really quite a, quite a special trip. Um, so, sorry. There we go. Ah, an albatross. Um, 
So, yeah, there were, there were, I mean, there was many uh, incredible moments down in Antarctica, but this, you know, I think seeing the albatrosses, seeing the whales, you, you know, I, I just felt that, I guess, connection to nature, which we all feel probably living in the New Forest and on the Solent, but to have the opportunity to, to, to do something about it and to join FFI was very special, and it helped that the role actually involved spending a lot of time in the field, so from you know, across Africa, Central America, uh, Southeast Asia, Northeast um, uh, Europe, and also the Caribbean and Australia, where FFI has this big global program. So my main role was fundraising, but I quickly sort of evolved the job into, into taking um, uh, big family offices, big philanthropists to see the projects, to really understand um, what we were doing, and it gave me some just in incredible opportunities to combine my kind of love of, of, of wildlife, to learn um, more about conservation, to meet some incredible people and have some yeah, truly wonderful experiences. Um, so in the end, I, I was with um, FFI for, for 10 years, um, but when uh, COVID came, sorry, ah, I also got to spend a lot of time with Sir David Attenborough, who was the vice president of FFI. Standing here now looking at some of this stuff, it feels a little bit surreal, to be honest, but for five or six years, I'd worked with David most months, um, mainly as a kind of a, as a bouncer, or someone who opened the car door for him as he went to events. But, um, but yeah, I'm very proud to, to, to know David and his daughter, Susan, and um, yeah, I will hope to you know, continue working with them. Um, and so over time, I you know evolved that sort of tour guide fundraiser into doing a lot of a lot of talking and um, and lobbying and getting involved with with different governments around the world and really I suppose trying to kind of force my point of view on them um, and and trying to understand kind of how how these countries operate and whilst we might have in, in this role the priority being wildlife conservation actually how does that how does that work with with local communities how does that work with big governments. Um, so I became a lot more aware of, of politics and um, you know, much more interested in that. Um, so uh, sort of as a local step, um, I got involved as a town councillor here in Lymington. Um, probably wasn't the best town councillor ever because unlike most people, I had a full-time job. But one of the things I did do, which I'm very proud of, was help um, to run the seawater bars. I was chairman of the seawater bars subcommittee in Hugo. I think we can all agree has done a wonderful job there. and. and Know, looking after a, such an old asset, um, turning it into a profitable business for the town was something um, that you know, I took great enjoyment and satisfaction from. And then um, as, as time moved on, um, the, the general election in 2019 came around and I had the opportunity to stand, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about politics here, but had, had the opportunity to, to get involved with the Green Party and stand as a candidate here, which you know, was a great challenge for me, but um, really brought together lots of different skills and experiences. And um, you know, I didn't agree with all of their policies, but the chance to highlight some environmental issues in what I felt was actually a broadly very receptive um, community was a, was a great opportunity. And you know, I'm not involved in, in the coming general election, but who knows what might come after that. So. Um, so then COVID arrived and, um, you know, I think like a lot of people on balance, I feel like we were very lucky in the forest compared to many of my friends and colleagues in, in the cities. But um, nevertheless, as a family, we thought that it was a great opportunity for us to go off cruising. It was something that Sophie and I had always spoken about. And my kind of travel guide, adventuring, conservation, fundraising work was, was going to be slow to pick up again. So I... Stopped full-time work at FFI, became a consultant, we sold our home, we took the boys out of school. Well, they weren't really in school anyway because it was COVID. And um, we bought a, a catamaran, a 40-foot catamaran seen here um, at the Royal Limington Yacht Club. And uh, the day before the Fastnet in 2021, we left. Um, didn't get very far, actually, that day. We just went to Studland Bay because... <laughs> Some of you might remember that was a particularly windy fast net start. Um, but eventually we made our way down um, through um, you know, down to the Canary Islands and, and Cape Verde across the Atlantic, through the Caribbean, Panama Canal, and to the South Pacific, which really was where you know, I think we all wanted to, to spend time. You know, it's an incredible place. A big part of this trip was to share, you know, I, I know looking back on my you know my, my life that probably my closest friends are those that I've shared some of the greatest adventures with. And I wanted to have that with my family. I also wanted to 
spend time um, you know, with, with wildlife and I suppose with local communities who are uh, sort of impacted by, by the changing in, in, of the climate and, and just um, you know, to, to live a relatively simple life. I mean, life nowadays is never that simple, but, um, and we had, you know, predictably, a marvelous family time. Um, some, some friends joined us for some of the key parts of the trip. Matt, I'll embarrass you here. Some of you might know Matt from um, Haven Key. He came down and joined us. Um, and uh, I am going to embarrass you, Matt, I'm afraid, actually. Um, you know, I think the furthest Matt had sailed was, was to cows um, f from Livington. But having played a lot of rugby together, I knew he had exactly the right character as an offshore sailor. So, so Matt arrived in the Galapagos, and his first offshore sail was, was 3,300 miles across the Pacific, which um, I always think was a, was a fantastic achievement. But, but this image is actually crossing the Atlantic. Um, you know, as a racing sailor, I've never really spent time looking under a boat, apart from when something's broken, or, or looking back, or, or fishing. So um, you know, there were a lot of new experiences for, for all of us. And this is a minke whale that spent about an hour just going back and forth under the boat. Um, Billy says two hours. Um, and um, yeah, so, uh, and this just went on. And we'd, you know, we, we'd sometimes wake the boys up and say, there's dolphins. And they'd be like, oh, yeah, not again. Um, <laughs> so um, just some incredible, incredible times. Um, and some beautiful you know, blue water, light wind sailing. But again, you know, the engineering stuff comes back into it. We shared a lot of our story as we were sailing, but we didn't share all of it because you know, some things you want to keep to yourself if you're planning to sell the boat afterwards. But um, <laughs> this, um, one of our rudders broke, so... And Rory and I just kind of fixed it in the marina. We were very lucky to have you know, the skills and the experience um, to do that, which made the trip a lot easier for us. Um, then obviously going through the Panama Canal was a big thing, the, the Bridge of Americas and, and that picture on the left. Um, and um, that really felt like the start of our trip. I'd been fortunate to sail a lot in the Atlantic and some time in the Caribbean, but I'd not been in the, in the Pacific, or certainly not up, um, up at, the, at the equator. Um, and, you know, we, we went to some of these places that I'd only really read about, the Marquesa Islands, the Tuamotos, just in, incredible um, experiences. And, um, you, know, you know, just I had diving gear, whereas everyone else was able to free dive by then. But, um, you know, diving with, with manta rays, you know, swimming with dolphins. Um, and uh, I think there's a, a fever of, of eagle rays there. Um, and it was really interesting to understand that, you know, some of the wildlife you'd really respect and enjoy and be in awe of, and at the same time, we were very much living that hand-to-mouth existence of, you know, Rory became a, you know, a great spear fisherman, and, and Billy here um, catching uh, coconut crabs, and, you know, a lot of fishing going on. So it was a, it was a very kind of real experience trying to decide um, you know, the different, I suppose, perspectives and viewpoints on all this. Um, and um, yeah, going well here, spearfishing with Rory and coming back and um, and sharing food on a small atoll when there's only eight people that live on that island is really quite incredible. Um, but again, um, more challenges in Fiji. I'll, I'll rattle through this a bit quickly. Um, but we one of the keels came off, um, which I mean, that, as I said to Sophie when I um, reported back, it's more like a you know like a daggerboard really, a fixed daggerboard. It's not ballasted. Uh, we ended up making a new one in Fiji with, um, with some local guys. Um, and so I think as a family, we, you know, we really learned that you know, these, these challenges come along. You don't have many options. Um, you just have to deal with it. Um, whilst we were doing some of those repairs, Sophie and the boys went off and got involved in a coral restoration project. Um, we had some amazing adventures, really remote. This is in the Lao group, the far east of Fiji, and this old um, sort of, I think it's a traditional sort of sacrifice site just to, to walk across and stumble into this kind of scene was really quite incredible um, and a lot of time surfing um, and then we came back to Livington um, um, I've sort of rattled through quite quickly because there's a bunch of things I want to cover but we got to New Zealand and um, I suppose the real world wanting to come back um, for schools and our careers and the financial pressure but the sailing will always be in our blood it's always been in mine and, and Sophie since we were children so so, you know, back here, we're back dinghy sailing, sailing on our old Contessa, another Humphreys Livington boat. Um, and then I had the chance to go and race in the Transat Jacques Vab, Vab with a woman called Pip Hare. Some of you might know from the last Vendee Globe, an old friend of mine. Um, so racing on these um, foiling 
um, 60 foot race boats that, that she will take on the next Vendée Globe in. And again, another lovely Lymington connection, Jason Carrington, many of you will know his team um, down in Hythe, put the new foils on this boat. Um, and yeah, I was really happy that, you know, this is a full professional scene, whereas I was actually working full time back at FFI and juggling this in my holidays. Thank you, boys, Sophie. Um, but um, we ended up coming 11th out of 40, which was a fantastic way, I think, to park the sailing. And, um, and yeah, and then I suppose after that, John invited me to become an ambassador for Limington Afloat with some incredibly illustrious and successful sailors. So I'm looking forward to, to helping to support that great initiative <laughs> later this year. And, and then um, the chance to join Tusk, this fantastic wildlife conservation organization in the role of CEO. So it felt like a really grown up job. Um, well, it, it still feels like a very grown up job protecting um, critically endangered species and habitats in, in Africa. Um, you know, I don't probably need to go into too many of these details. Many of you will be aware of, um, you know, poaching is still rife. You know, you hear some success stories, you hear some, um, you hear some horror stories as well. But there's about 400,000 elephants left, left in Africa, but 20,000 a year are being killed. That rate's going up. Some of you who, who follow the news closely will have seen you know, human wildlife conflict, especially with elephants, is a huge problem, especially in Botswana. The Botswana president fairly famously offered to send 10,000 elephants to, to Hyde Park a few weeks ago um, and see how we deal with living with them. So, you know, the, the reality, I'll come on to some of the solutions and, um, and wildlife tra trafficking. Um, also, obviously, you know, human population growth um, presents a lot of a lot of challenges, no more so than in Africa. Um, and, and just those local issues, that, that conflict of wildlife living with, um, you know, living with local communities, trying to make their living in, in um, you know, a sort of a, or certainly the farming communities um, is, is very challenging. So, so some of the solutions, and this is really why, you know, Tusk's work is so important that, you know, there are many wonderful conservationists out there, academics, scientists, coming up with amazing solutions. What I love about Tusk as a, as a sort of, as an engineer and a, and a kind of like to get my hands dirty kind of person is they're real practical solutions. You know, I really believe that a lot of the best solutions in life are simple, things that are easy to, to both implement and to, to monitor and evaluate your success. So, you know, whether it's ranger patrols or, or just setting up monitoring programs to understand um, you know, wildlife patterns and how they're interacting with communities. Um, and you know, on occasions, rescues, reintroductions, rewilding, um, you know, working with governments to help not only create national parks, but to make them um, kind of viable long-term solutions, um, to make them something that communities benefit from as well as, as wildlife because you know, there's, there's two schools of thought with conservation. I'm not going to get into too many of the details, but there's the idea of fortress conservation, which you might see in somewhere like South Africa, which is very much you know, building fences and separating, or um, community conservation, which is very much wildlife and communities living side by side. And the problem with fortress conservation is it tends to exclude communities from and, and creates this well, physical barrier. But, they don't tend to derive the benefit from it either. These are privately owned farms. Whereas community conservation is very much about empowering communities to, to understand the value of nature and to benefit from it directly. And so, you know, as, as, as Tusk, this kind of, you know, this organization actually based in, in Dorset, you know, you, the last thing you want to do is to go into any of these areas and tell people how to do it. You know, you want to go to these areas and understand what people's problems are, what they're struggling with, find solutions, offer to them, them sh you know, share with them what's worked in the past, and then hopefully provide the resources, um, which is mainly what we do at Tusk, fundraising, provide the resources to help address you know, many of these challenges um, through all sorts of unique methods. Um, and as I said, a lot of it is, you know, I love the kind of engineering side of it. A lot of it is, is quite basic stuff, but it's looking and, and, and figuring out what's worked in one place, maybe that will work here, um, and evaluate, evaluating the success. 
Um, and one of the other great things that Tusk did that we, that we never did at FFI because it was very much a sort of an academic organization is, is the education programs. And you know, people have different, different views on the successes, but you know, for me, uh, the uh, PACE, it's called, Pan-African Conservation Education Program, is incredible. You know, I've seen it um, just last month in Uganda, you know, working with local schools, providing the materials um, for children to really understand the value of nature because that's what it comes down to you know I think if you're from a very rural community and you see elephants coming in and destroying your crops then it's, it's pretty hard for you to have a kind of empathy for, for their plight but when you can see the upsides of it whether that's kind of tourism revenue or, or many other benefits then um, then I think that the local communities really want to be a part of these conservation efforts um, and one of the other great things we do at Tusk, as I've said before, is really empowering conservation champions. And one of the ways we do that is through the, um, the Tusk Conservation Awards. We're very fortunate that, um, that Prince William is, is the long-standing patron of Tusk. And um, you know, for the last, uh, I think, maybe 12 years now, um, there have been three different award winners. Um, you know, it's a big glitzy thing um, at the Savoy Hotel. And you know, it's a really amazing opportunity to not only to sort of put one of these conservation champions in the spotlight, but also to give them funding to, to continue to run their programs and to, and to step them forwards. Um, and I just want to briefly touch on this. I'm coming towards the end. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, I mentioned about monitoring the success of your programs. It's very difficult to do when you're a funder where you're not the sole funder. You know, we can't claim the credit for the success of of a whole organization in Africa if we're just giving them a little bit of funding. But um, you know, these are the, the, the broad numbers. You know, 54 million hectares, I always think of that as, as 54 million rugby pitches, um, have been secured for wildlife. You know, over a million people have used our education program. Over 10 million people have benefited directly and indirectly through Tusk Project Partners. Um, and the efficiency, you know, in my days working with, with David, we would look at something called, I think, total expense ratios, which was very much about what the sort of the fund managers were taking from your investments. Well, here, you know, we have um, 91 pence of every pound goes directly into the projects. 6P supports um, the, the costs of running the programs, the administrative side, and 3P into, into um, raising the money. So those are really low overheads for any organization. And again, you know, when I made the decision to go to Tusk, that was a kind of a key thing for me. I'm just going to touch on um, one of the, the projects that we were talking about earlier in Lewa and Kenya. Um, you know, this is a, an example of a really successful community conservation program. Um, and you know, it's got one of East Africa's largest population of black rhino. Um, and huge uh, conservation uh, education program as well. But it costs a lot of money, a security team of over 150 to keep the wildlife there safe. So you can get a pretty good idea of, of kind of what it, what it costs. And you know, East Africa compared to say DRC or, or, or South Africa, you know, the poaching figures are much lower there. So um, in those areas, it costs even more to protect wildlife. Um, and then I, I've talked about um, PACE, the, the Pan-African Conservation Education Program. Um, and maybe I just draw your attention to, to the crosses um, on, on, the, on the map there of Africa. You know, that's something that what is really one of my big ambitions with TUS to roll out on a much bigger scale. Um, you know, one of the, the challenges is that actually a lot of the local schools there, they're so remote, they certainly don't have internet connections, they don't have computers, they don't have tablets. So I mean, you, you're still giving them kind of A4 textbooks, but actually they really love that, that physical um, connection, but then they obviously need to be updated, um, and, um, and it's phenomenal the amount of materials that you need to get out there. Um, some of them get printed on the continent, but they can't all, and so we're really grateful for, for DHL's amazing partnership with Tusk. Um, and just really coming to the close, just, uh, you know, it's again, very lucky that we have this biennial symposium. We get together all of Tusk's kind of 50 partners from, from around Africa every other year. And this happened in, um, in March. So for me, the opportunity to meet 50 project leads or at least senior staff um, from all over the continent was just you know, an incredible opportunity for me to learn and to build connections with, with a group of amazing people. 
Um, and I still get to spend time in the field, but, but I'm having to do more of the grown-up stuff, managing the, the sort of the governance, the HR, um, but it's a you know, pretty wonderful journey. And, and, um, and really, it, it, you know, all of these different things I've talked about, I feel like have actually got me to this point. I've got a very funny CV, really, if you look at it on paper, but, but all of the different skills, whether it's the engineering, the fundraising, the politics, um, the conservation side, the exploring, has all really, I think, led me to be a more... Um, kind of in influential conservation leader. So, um, so yeah, thank you for your attention. And if you want to ask any questions about any of that, I'll happily give them a go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Well, I'm certainly in awe. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, are there any questions? Don't be. Yes. So Pam's coming around with the microphone, unless you can shout. Okay, so the question is, where does the money come from for, for Tusk, I assume? So um, Tusk is mainly um, private individuals, um, family offices, um, and corporations. So we don't, for want of a better term, own any of our projects. So we're supporting small organizations across Africa by giving them whether it's either funding or we make introductions to other funders or partners. Um, so governments tend to, you have to sort of own the project if you like. So government funding, statutory funding um, was something I did in my previous role at FFI. But you know, one of the beauties I think of Tusk is you know, whilst we're a, a long-term loyal funder to many people, we're also able to, um, to, to pivot if you like to more important or impactful projects as, as situations change. You know, one of the, one of the struggles for, for big NGOs is you end up committed to huge landscape projects for a long time. And, you know, that priority around kind of conservation impact will, will vary. So, again, this, this sort of slightly simple model of, of um, supporting other projects, I think, is, is much more um, valid in the long term. Yes. Yeah, no, um, very topical question at the moment. Um, I could give you the, the sort of the political correct answer, but, but personally, um, you know, I just could never imagine um, shooting anything. Um, you know, I, I certainly couldn't even shoot a pheasant. So personally, um, um, you know, personally that, that is not something I, I could ever abide. But as a, as a conservationist with... You know, a fairly in-depth understanding now of conservation issues. I recognise there are some countries and some areas where um, you know, there, there is a valid argument um, for. You know, it's about wildlife. You know, sources of revenue to protect wildlife are, are few and far between. So there are certainly, you know, in Botswana, which is what's in the news at the moment. You know, that Botswana has an incredible number of elephants. They cause a huge number of problems. And there they do um, issue licenses to, um, to shoot some specific um, elephants. The argument is usually ones that are no longer contributing to the gene pool or troublesome elephants. Um, but yeah, personally, I just, you know, I could never, never stomach that. But at the same time, I mean, I actually got asked to um, comment on BBC Newsnight two nights ago about some of the press that's been there. And, and, you know, I declined to comment because I don't really see any value in that for me or Tusk personally. You know, we have a pragmatic approach to it, but I don't think we've got anything to gain by shouting about our opinions. You know, we're about supporting grassroots conservation organisations in Africa. You know, we're not about getting involved in political games. So. There's a question at the back. Uh, uh, hi, Nick. Um, I was impressed by the 91p in the pound. Because yeah. I've been at seminars at which we've discussed, is it worth carrying on if we you know, can give 10p for every pound we raise, sort of thing? Um, what, what's the secret? You're a, you're a lean, mean organisation, or is it just that you offload the overheads to other organisations? Mm. So, yeah, great question, Annette. Um, there's a couple of different answers there. We have a very simple business model. So, you know, we say so my previous role at FFI, where the overheads were a bit higher, there are a big group of academics there that would be designing conservation solutions, would be spending a lot of time training young conservationists, and how you account for that overhead number 
there, there are different ways of, of, of doing those accounts. What you consider to be core conservation activities might not be the, the same. You know, it's not always apples with apples. Um, but for Tusk, it's just about a very simple, um, you know, simple business model. Um, I, I would also say, though, that you know, if you, any of you were investing in a business, then you, know, you wouldn't really invest in a business that wasn't investing in itself. You know, every business needs to grow. And you know, if you want to employ good staff, then you're going to have to pay them properly. And you've got to be competitive. So you know, I always say to people, um, or, or certainly to, to my fundraising team, you know, don't lead with, we've got really low overheads. You know, talk about all the wonderful things you do and, and maybe kick the ball in the back of the net by telling them how low your overheads are. It, and it, you know, if you have higher overheads, but there's valid reasons for it, then I think people understand that. Uh, would you and your family consider going back on your travels to finish off uh, unfinished business? <laughs> well, maybe I'm not best placed to answer that, but, um, <laughs> but, but maybe I'll just tell you a little anecdote. We, um, um, we, <laughs> we were out with some friends a while ago, and, um, and they were talking about our, you know, sailing and cruising, and, and, um, and uh, I don't know, maybe I, I promised to do something, I can't quite remember. And Rory turned around to me and said, um, oh, Dad, you'll never do that. I mean, you said we'd sail around the world and we only got to New Zealand. <laughs> so so um, I think there's still appetite to go and do, to go and do more. Um, but it was a great time for us in terms of, you know, the boys were six and seven. So, um, you know, now we're, we're back here and nine and ten involved in, you know, oppie sailing and playing rugby in New Milton. And so... You know, we have seen a few cruising families that have become kind of sea gypsies, for want of a better term. And you see the children don't really want to be there anymore. Um, and it's a juggle to try and have these great adventures, but also keep your, you know, careers on track. And for me, I think I've, you know, just about managed it so far. And Sophie's now running the, the sailing program for Emberley School. So, um, you know, it, it's hard, isn't it, to, to keep everything going? But I imagine one day, in answer to your question, we'll go back to New Zealand and sail home, yes. <laughs> Yeah. How difficult is, is it for you? Okay. Uh, going back to the ele elephants, how difficult is it for you persuading the local people uh, whose crops are being regularly trampled and their <laughs> livelihood destroyed, especially in times of famine and, uh, and dry weather? Yeah, so I mean, it's exceptionally difficult. Um, and I mean, I, elephants in particular are incredibly difficult to live with. Um, they're incredibly clever animals, as has been very well documented. And so, you know, you can't just relocate elephants to a different area. They will revert back to where they want to be. Um, you know, there are some huge elephant relocation programs, but I don't think any of them have been hugely successful. So with the communities, it's just about, you know, working with them on, you know, sometimes it's physical fences. I mean, one of the most, I think, exciting initiatives that we fund at Tusk is... Um, is a research program into finding, um, it's basically, uh, any chemist in the room will, will, not, will not like my description, but it's a kind of, it's using different natural scents um, and trying to create a bio fence. So finding, um, you know, we know for instance, elephants don't like um, bees. So that's why you have beehive fences. Um, we, we know there are certain smells that they don't like. So if you can put that, um, sent onto a fence that might otherwise, you know, be a sort of two seconds for them to remove with their tusks, then it will be more successful. So trying to find innovative ways to, to keep them out is one of the, you know, the big challenges. I think the last resort sometimes is to compensate um, villagers and farmers for crops that are damaged. Um, it, it, that's not the, a short-term solution. That's usually a kind of intermediary solution. Um, but no, it's, it's not easy. Do you think that um, most of the poaching is um, organised crime or is it um, opp opportunist by those people who are suffering the effects of the elephants? Yeah. So, um, uh, for instance, during COVID, um, when a lot of local communities were really struggling, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of Africans make their money out of tourism. When tourism was, was shut off, they were really struggling to exist. So there were really high rates of 
poaching then for bush meat for people simply to eat. In in normal times, certainly previously and now, you know, a lot of the poaching we see is is really sophisticated and organised. Um, you know, it's fairly well documented that. Um, uh, Rhino um, horn is worth more in some cases than diamond pound for pound. You know, there's incredible amounts of money for people that have very little. So, um, and like a lot of these kind of organised crime activities, you know, there are so many people in the chain that to try and um, sort of track through them is, is really difficult. So, um, most of the, um, the you know, the, if you're talking elephant tusks or rhinos, that's usually very sophisticated and organised. But, you know, at the same time, we've got more sophisticated methods to respond to that. Um, I had a fascinating, fascinating meeting this week um, with a lady who's um, head of a sort of forensic department with the police in central London. And she's been involved in doing a lot of forensics training in Africa with rangers and local police there to help try and you know, track down um, uh, poachers following incidents. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the answer to your question is is very sophisticated and organised because there's huge amounts of money in it. Do you have different problems in different African countries? Um, Martina, it's nice to see you again. Stalwart of the town council, for those who don't know. Um, Yes, of course. Yeah, I mean, um, I've done a lot of work in, in northern Mozambique in a place called Nyasa Special Reserve, roughly the size of Wales. You've got three communities there. Um, you know, there's very, very little human-wildlife conflict. And, you know, from a, from a pure conservation perspective, I've loved working there because you're, you know, it's a, it's a true wilderness. You don't have that community juggle. Um, it's much easier to, to help wildlife numbers grow. Somewhere like Kenya, where, you know, super developed African country, massive pressure on land and resources. Um, and you see, for anyone who's even been to Nairobi, you know, that the, the wildlife is on the edge of the city. Um, you know, it's hugely challenging. Um, you've got different governments. Some of them are very, um, you know, pro-wildlife, see it as a huge source of revenue. For instance, in Rwanda, the mountain gorillas, you know, the single largest contributor to Rwanda's GDP. Um, but then you go across to DRC and the government there, you know, very lawless country really, and so their, their investment horizon, their perspective is very short. So anything that can raise money for them, very corrupt government, um, then they'll jump at. Or if you go to, you know, West Africa again, those sort of um, French-speaking countries, a lot of them, um, you know, again, very dangerous countries to operate in, very difficult to work. Um, South Sudan, the same. We do a lot of work in South Sudan. So, um, but that's where I think it's really key that you're not the, the white saviour that comes in with your idea that you learned at university. You know, it's about working with the local communities, the indigenous people that have that knowledge, um, and really supporting them because they're far better placed than, than us. Yes, Rory. Do the animals ever come into the cities? Well, um, I can tell you, if you go to Romania and you want to see um, a bear, the best place to do it is to go into the cities and hang around by the dumpsters, as they call it. But, um, but yeah, um, yeah. Any other? Yes, Billy. <laughs> Do any of the animals escape? So interesting. So some of in Kenya, some of the big concessions, and there's lots of different terms, but big farms, you know, they, they make their money out of out of tourism, really. There's a little bit of, of cattle um, ranching. But so you've got these big concessions where um, the, the managers of them want to keep the wildlife there because that's the attraction. But at the same time, you have to have these wildlife corridors so that they can migrate as they would do naturally. So they tend to have fences, but with um, these, these corridors um, and pathways. So they don't escape, but they're just following their normal behaviours. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Nick. That was fascinating, and I think we've all enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you. Well, thank you, Prue.
I should say that uh, Nick kindly mentioned Limington Afloat, which is um, a festival that St. Barb is organising and hosting um, from September onwards this year. But we're starting now with a series of lectures that involve um, the, the river and the things that go on on the river, which is what Limington Afloat is about. It's a festival celebrating the innovation that goes on in Limington afloat. And um, Nick, thank you for being an ambassador and thank you for kicking off a series of talks about the river and the life we will be talking. We'll have the Harbour Master, um, the RNLI and various other people from around Limington talking to us over the next few months. So don't forget, the next talk is about the history and the future for St. Barb and how it grew and how it's going to go forward. So that'll be a team led by David Rule, past chairman of the trustees. And um, we look forward to that. So don't forget the 3rd of May and have a safe trip home. Good evening. Thank you.